I love a good clickbaity title, don't you? I think it's because we live these really messy, complex lives, and it is so tempting to believe, even just for a moment, in the promise of something like this. A list, a series of life hacks, a probably generically useless abstraction to help you make sense of everything. Except it doesn't really work, does it? Because, honestly, anyone who promises to have answers usually doesn't. And so here I am, starting my TED talk with a blatant lie. Ooh, sorry. Except there's this thing here, lessons to ignore, as if I'm about to share with you some particularly clever trick or secret. Which one, no promises, but two, even if I was going to share some secret, why should you trust me? Well, you probably shouldn't, but if we were to establish trust, how would we do it? Well, you could maybe get to know me, except, you know, we have about 10 minutes left, maybe nine, so I need to be zippy about it. So I figured maybe the best thing to offer is to share some of my stories, some of the lessons that have been a little bit hard learned for me, and you can learn from that, hopefully, or decide that you should just ignore it. So who am I? Well, my life has largely been defined by this formula. Try hard, win a few prizes, receive recognition. Seems easy enough. For me, that looked like this, uh, which many of you will recognize as the equal parts mind-numbing and meditative bottom of a swimming pool because I was a swimmer. I trained a lot and occasionally I won stuff. Uh, usually I just stood around on a pool deck shivering and looking kind of angry. Yeah, look, I don't know why, I just looked angry all of the time. Um, and I think that's because of a couple things, so let's get past the terrible pictures of myself that I will regret being on the internet, and get to this point, which is as a swimmer, I had this amazing credibility transfer thing. I swam fast, I had confidence, I got friends and a community as a result of that, and I knew who I was. Except, I got hurt, I got sick, I realized I wasn't going to be an Olympic medalist, don't ask me why it took me so long to figure that out, and suddenly I was 18 and I had a complete crisis of character. Who was I without this thing that I was good at? David Brooks would call this the first mountain of your life. Uh, I wish that I could tell you that I quickly figured out that I am not what I do, but it's actually not true. I just threw myself into the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I became a rock climber and a kiteboarder and an engineer, and I completely dedicated myself to each one of those things. Here's the thing, though. It wasn't all smiles, because basically every couple of years, some catastrophic, crippling, horrible thing would happen. I will spare you some of the grisly and gory details and the far less cute pictures, but suffice to say that it took friends with broken backs and broken necks. It took knee replacements. It took failed companies and lost jobs before I finally figured out that I am not just what I do and that this cycle process wasn't gonna work out for me in the long run. But the question is, how do you break that? So for me, that meant trying to understand what I was actually optimizing for. And the thing that I always optimize for is to surround myself with the type of brilliant people who I think make a world that I wanna live in. So six months ago, my brilliant co-founder and I started a new venture capital fund called Future Ventures. And we have this incredible opportunity to fund the world's best and brightest people, to make realities out of the most audacious ideas. And the thing about that is, is that this middle part there doesn't work. You can't win a prize in venture capital. You can make a lot of money, but it's so far down the road that by the time you figure out if you're any good at it, it actually doesn't matter. So we need to figure out a way to define our value and our self-worth by realizing that we're communal creatures. And the thing that we actually need to optimize for is building relationships, building communities, surrounding ourselves with people that we learn from and learn with. And what it meant for me was that having to refocus my life every few years, find a new way to redefine myself, taught me that I didn't need a placard 
to show that I belonged anywhere in particular, but that all I needed to do was show up and surround myself with the type of people who build wonder. However, not all people are awesome, right? Not all people are kind and brilliant and helpful. Not all relationships are healthy. Most of them, I've been in a few. Um, and that's okay, but that made me kind of have to wrestle with the next big question, which is, who's looking out for me? Because just because we seek community doesn't mean we end up in communities that are useful for us. Let me give you a simple example. I was working at a large chemical and materials company. It was a rebound job after a failed startup. I loved the security, the confidence, the rigor of knowing I was actually gonna have a paycheck next week, except I was bored out of my mind. And it was a great job, but it was the wrong job for me. I was not at my best and highest use there, and the company was doing itself a disservice by keeping somebody employed who literally wanted to gouge her own eyeballs out rather than spend another minute pulling polymer mixtures out of a braid bender. You don't know what that thing is, and I promise you don't want to. So I had to get out, because it was a good job, but it was the wrong job for me. I found, I applied to way too many jobs, but I found one. And I got it, yes. And it was a weird role because it meant changing myself again. It was a consulting firm and it lived between this abstraction layer between the lab bench and corporate strategy. I was psyched and horrified and in way over my head. And so I went to one of my mentors at the materials company. I said, you know, I have this opportunity. I think I wanna take it. And he listened to me, my mentor, and he sat me down and he said, you know, I think you taking this job is going to be the worst decision you are going to make in your career. Because your advice is going to fall on deaf ears. Who is going to believe you? And why should they? You're a kid, you didn't even finish your PhD. This is not the right way to build your career. That was gut-wrenching, right? This is a person who I trusted. And here's the thing, he wasn't coming from a crazy, sexist, ageist, backwater, easy to ignore perspective. This was heartfelt advice. Oh. Because he was stuck in his own dogma. Because this is the dangerous thing, right? When you build up your life and your story, what better way to validate it than to pull someone else in along, to build little mini-me's and protégés and prove that your path is correct, except that I think it's dangerous and destructive and pretty damaging for all parties involved. There are lots of excellent paths out there. I've been so fortunate to try a few of them, but how do you know which one's the actual one for you? How do you know that it's your story and not somebody else's? Well, my only advice is, Pay attention to the advice that people are giving you. Is it heartfelt? Is it meant for you? This happens all of the time. Leaving academia, terrible decision. You heard the story about my transition from engineering to consulting. Leaving the first venture fund I joined, worst decision I've ever made. Leaving the second venture fund I ever, how could I? Starting my new venture fund with my partner Steve, might as well dig my own grave. If I had listened, to some of my various mentors over the years, I'd probably be in the back of a dark closet with a bucket over my head. But the thing is that they weren't actually being cruel to me, they were just telling me their story, projecting it, as we learned earlier, onto me. And that wasn't my story, but I learned to use that. I learned to use people's projections on me and of me as a superpower, as learning, okay, that's actually how you see me? Great, I can work at that. And the thing is, I'm incredibly fortunate because I have these amazing parents who I got to call every time I heard this crazy storm, and they would listen, and they would level set, and my mom blew more than a few fuses and promised to drive to God knows where and yell at whoever was telling me I wasn't good enough, and I don't know how you do anything without starting from a base as strong as that. But I also met incredible people Kevin C., Paul Aramenko, Stan Strobard, Steve Jurvetson, just a handful of the people who saw something in me that I certainly didn't see in myself at the time, who gave me roles and responsibilities that I had no business being in, and who trusted that I would figure it out by the time that it mattered. And you know what I usually did? 
So that's the thing. Mentors matter. They matter a lot. But picking your mentors, like picking your goals, you have to find the ones that propel you forward and don't leave you stuck in other people's stories. Because if I've learned anything, it's that there are no adults in the room. Everybody is at sea, but at least you get to pick who's in your lifeboat with you. So show up. Build the communities that you want to be a part of. Find your mentors, figure out who's in your lifeboat. And I think I said three lessons, but I also said ignore me, because this isn't about me. This is about your stories and the things you're going to build. So don't take it so seriously. Enjoy yourself. Build a life you're proud of. And if you want to start a company, come find me. Thank you.